Welcome to Worship Christ United Methodist Church. It's a joy to be with you as we uh, come together to worship God in what hopefully is the last of our online-only worship services. The church council has uh, come to the decision that we can return to in-person worship, and that will begin next Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. Now, a couple things I need to let you know about is that we will have to gather still in a very limited way. We'll have to keep six feet in between seating of family groups, we'll have to keep our masks on, uh, and all those things. And to be able to keep that six feet, uh, we need you to pre-register before you come. Uh, and that actually will open up today. There'll be information on the screen at the end of the service of how to do it. It will also be in the email of how to do that. We use software to do that, and I understand that not everybody can go on the computer and do that. If you're one of those folks who just, you know, the computer just isn't going to be your thing, uh, you can call the office, and we will get you registered that way also. But, uh, but if you're able to, please use the, the, the program. It makes it so much easier for Christy. You will have to register uh, anywhere between noon on Sunday, the Sunday before, and noon on Thursday prior. After noon on Thursday, uh, it will close because that's when Christy has to start seating people. So, um, so that's what's coming up. Exciting. We'll be able to be back in person, and we're looking forward to that. And um, and so, welcome in the name of Jesus. If there's someone near you, welcome them. And if there's not someone near you, maybe you pull out your cell phone and text them in the name of Jesus. Let's worship God together. Good morning. Let us join our voices together. The old rugged cross. his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean I lay down I will 
I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Let us continue with our call to worship. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let us continue with Change My Heart, O God. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. I invite you now to join us in a prayer as we honor God's presence here and as we look to other things we might need to ask God. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to praise you and to honor you in this time of worship. You are the most holy one. You are with the gift that is to be with each of us. It is a gift we appreciate. We know that you love the children of this earth. And as we ask for our, our children to receive love and care as they struggle with what they don't understand. So many children are watching family members who are sick with this COVID problem. Many are not learning as they can. Many are hungry. Many see the sadness in their parents who have lost jobs and can't care and can't be as joyful as they should. Our children do not understand all of this. Give us the wisdom and the strength to join you, God, in loving and caring for all the children of the earth. We also begin to feel a sense of hope in the difficult year we've had. We give thanks for those who have worked hard to create the solutions that bring us that hope. Thank you for guiding those who have worked and hard and, and have brought us some of those solutions. They continue to guide us and you will continue to guide them as well. 
We also pray with care and strength for the pastors who guide us in worship and prayer and hope. We are one people, even when we are not in this room together. Thanks for your patience when we expect answers quickly. Share your patience with us that we might feel your calm presence. You, God, are the creator. You have given us the gift of your Son, our Savior, and of the spirit of holy comfort. So in the voice of togetherness, let us pray as Jesus, our Father, has asked us and taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord my God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O Ask me not away from thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, my God, and renew a right spirit. stand amazed in your presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean for me it was in the garden. He prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for
took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. And when, when with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall joy through the ages to sing of his love for me how marvelous how wonderful my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful How wonderful indeed. We are now in the fifth Sunday in Lent. Hard to believe that we are that far along in this year already. Uh, the next week will be Palm Sunday, and after that it's Easter. And so the year is just flying right by. And of course, being in the fifth Sunday in Lent, this also means this is the fifth Sunday in our sermon series that's entitled The Unexpected Moment. And it's a sermon series that uses paintings by the artist Donald Krauss. And the scriptures have inspired his paintings and will use those paintings to take us back into the scriptures from which they come. And before I unveil today's painting, I want to let you know there'll be a QR code on your screen. If you came to this worship service through an email invitation, there would have been a QR code also in that email. It's also a QR code on the homepage of our website. Any one of those QR codes, you can use a second electronic device and get a copy of this on your device, and you can zoom in on the details if you like. But I don't know that you'll need it. I think the camera shots will be tight enough that you'll be able to see what's going on here. But it's there if you want it, and, um, and there if you need it. So. Elaine has carefully selected a piece of music to accompany this painting, so I'm going to unveil this and invite us to begin just by looking at the painting and see what we see, and then we'll dig in. So, Elaine...
So this is Donald Krauss's interpretation of Jesus anointed by the woman. And I'll show you that this is the first of Donald Krauss's paintings that I ever saw. And when I saw this painting, it just captured me. And this is just such an interesting painting all by itself, even if you didn't know what the scripture was that went with it. And then once I heard that this was a depiction of Jesus being anointed by the woman with the jar of nard, I saw, wow. What an amazing way to, to present that, that it looks nothing like what I picture, and yet it is exactly the story. And I was just captured by this. And so this is the one that hooked me. And so if you have enjoyed this series, this is the one that you have to thank for that. This is the one that started it all. The style of painting here, and I'm sure there's a name for it, but I don't know enough about art to be able to tell you what that name is, but to take um, uh, today's people and a today's setting and drop that into the biblical story is such an amazing way to span the, the, the time from 2,000 years ago to today. And that is every pastor's task of every sermon is to take those old stories and bring the meaning forward to uh, something that, uh, that is, we have a point of contact with today. That's the exegetical task, that what did the story mean to the people then, and how is that same meaning brought forward to us today? And what better way to do that than to just take us and put us in the story? Uh, really remarkable way. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Donald Krauss's work. Very, very interesting and um, meaningful. So let's start with the location of the painting. And before we can locate this painting in the scriptures, we need to figure out which of the anointing stories this is. Because all four Gospels tell a story that is very similar to this, but they all tell it differently. So let's start with Luke's story. In Luke's uh, story of anointing, it happens up in Galilee, and uh, there is a woman who comes to a dinner. They're at this, the house of Simon the Pharisee, and she comes and she washes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. And that's not really what's going on here. So I don't think we've got Luke's setting in Galilee uh, in this picture or painting. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, John also tells a story very similar to this. And in John's gospel, this story is set in Bethany at the home of Lazarus. And in that telling of the story, there's a woman who comes and uses a jar of nard, but she anoints Jesus' feet with the nard and then wipes them with her hair. And again, that's not really what's happening here. Matthew and Mark tell the story very similarly. And, uh, and in those two stories, Jesus is anointed with nard by a woman and it's poured over Jesus' head. And clearly that's what's happening here while people look on in judgment. And uh, so since Mark is source material for Matthew's gospel, then we have what in the, this painting, uh, Mark's telling of this story. So, with this being Mark's telling, this would take place at the home of Simon the leper. Now, we don't know very much about Simon the leper. All we know is that he had a home in Bethany and that he uh, uh, had some people over for dinner, invited Jesus and some other folks, and they came with him. And we know that he had a home, and we know that he was a leper. Now, that last detail is really important because leprosy was a pretty severe condition back then, and it was a condition that required separation and isolation. We wouldn't know anything about illnesses that require separation and isolation, would we? No. <laughs> Today, we would call this separation and isolation, quarantine and social distancing. So what in the world is Jesus and some other folks doing at the home of a leper? You know, are they just ignoring the CDC guidelines and uh, disobeying the mask mandates? You know, s scholars have been, uh, you know, puzzled by this. That how could this take place? Because they know that the cultural requirements back at that time were that if someone was a leper, they could not be in the community. They had to be outside of the community. 
And if they were to be anywhere near anyone or if paths were going to cross or anything, they had to holler out, unclean, unclean, and keep themselves completely covered. And so, you know, the scholars have wrestled with, well, how is it then that Jesus and others have accepted an invitation to go to the house of a leper? And the answer is probably as simple as who's sitting right here in this chair. Jesus. You know, Simon the leper is most likely one of the many lepers that Jesus healed when he was, you know, in ministry and healing people. So, this is the home of Simon the leper, which is remarkably similar to Donald Krause's house. <laughs> This is the house that Donald Krauss lived in when he painted this painting. And so these are the art pieces that are on his walls, and this is his table, and, uh, you know, this is his chair, and these are his friends, and this is his cat that likes melon, and, uh, and all of these ordinary things that are in this painting remind us that Jesus entered into ordinary lives and changed them in the most unexpected of ways. Now, each of the paintings in this series have captured the unexpected moment when God is working in an unexpected way that changes everything. And in this painting, it's a little bit different. It is not so much what God is doing as it is what this woman here is doing. This woman has taken a costly jar of nard and broken it open and anointed Jesus' head. And uh, Donald Krauss has painted them in a very loving way. And if you look at her, you know, the expression on her face is very caring, and she's focused completely on him. She has her hand on the side of his head, pulling his head in closer to her, and their, their, their heads are so close together that, you know, you could almost get a kiss in there. Uh, you know, this is the kind of boundary crossing that would cause a wife to say, hey, what are you doing? What's going on? You know, <laughs> back off, Missy. Uh, you know, this is, this is boundary crossing in an extreme way. You certainly couldn't do this at work. You know, this kind of boundary crossing would end you up in the HR department, and they would be uh, explaining to you what boundaries are. It's boundary crossing in our day, and this certainly is boundary crossing in Jesus day. Now, just a side note, these two people that posed for this painting, uh, they're husband and wife. And so there, there they are. Now, Jesus, he has been painted in a way, and he's not like any Jesus I've ever seen. He's painted in a way that is receiving. He's appreciative of what she is doing He's receiving this, he's enjoying this, and he, he knows what she is doing, even though she may not know the higher meaning of what she's doing. That she is expressing love, and he is understanding this as the anointing of his body for his burial. She doesn't fully understand that, and certainly these folks don't understand the bigger picture of what's going on here. So Jesus is depicted receiving this, enjoying this. This is a wonderful gift. And these folks look on in judgment. You know, they're saying to themselves, can you believe what she's doing? Did she really just take that expensive jar of nard and just break that and pour that over his head? What a waste. Is, are you kidding me? And they're about to get in her face about that. Uh, the story says that they scolded her. No, oh, she's an adult, and they scold her. But aren't there always people like this? People who, who don't see the bigger picture and are ready to pass judgment. The Bible is full of folks like this, the folks who are right in their own minds. You know, folks like this who say, what a waste that was. The Bible's full of these folks. We know their stories. The people who watched Jesus heal a blind man 
and on a Sabbath day. And, and instead of being excited about that and, and seeing the wonderful miracle, instead they're concerned with, uh, he shouldn't have done that on a Sabbath day. He should have waited till tomorrow to do that. What an offense against God's law. Really. You see a bigger picture. You know the folks. The Bible's full of folks like this. Folks who uh, look on in judgment and say, who does this fellow think he is that he can forgive sins? Well, they ought to be saying, thank God that this man can forgive sins. We know these kind of folks. They're the kind of folks who might look at a beautiful church and not see the devotion to God that went into it, not see that church as an act of worship and an expression of love for God. Instead, say, oh, what a waste. Look at all the good that could have been done with the money that went to build that church, you know, this sort of thing. Those kind of folks rarely are on board with the mission. You know, they're folks like Judas Iscariot, who this was the last straw for Judas. After this, he went to the chief priests and said, hey, I'll hand him over to you. And from then on, he looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus. While she's expressing this extravagant love for Jesus, Judas is figuring out, how do we put an end to this? But the Bible is also filled with women like this, people like this, extravagant people who love God and show that love in extravagant ways. And we know their stories too. You know, the woman who put a couple copper coins in the uh, temple treasury box, didn't seem like much at the time until we find out that that's all that she has to live on. We know the stories of people like this. You know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Samaritan who uh, saw a traveler who was beaten and left for dead. And he took him and took him to the inn and paid for his stay and paid for his medical treatment. And he said, you know, if there's anything else to pay, when I come back, I'll take care of that too. You know, we know the story of people like this. Joseph of Arimathea, who spent a lot of money to have a stone cutter carve out a, a tomb for himself. And yet, when we needed a place for Jesus' body, he said, let's put him in my tomb. We know the story of people like this. We know them. The kind of people who buy things and put them in the blessing box out in front of the church. The kind of folks who work all night long and yet come to the food drop on Thursday to help feed hungry people. You know, they're the kind of folks who empty their wallet for someone who doesn't have a place to stay or doesn't have something to eat, while others look on and say, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. We know them. They're the people who do something for someone else in an unexpected moment. If they're people who cross boundaries, they are people who go to the other side of town. They are people who show the love of God to others, even though people look on in judgment and say, you shouldn't be doing that. They ought to be helping themselves. You're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. It's as big as a waste as this jar of nard. The unexpected moment captured in this painting is this extravagant expression of this woman's love for Jesus. But folks, we can be that unexpected moment. Every time we feed hungry people, we can be that unexpected moment every time we give a drink to someone who's thirsty. We can be that unexpected moment every time we show welcome to a stranger or every time we feed or uh, clothe people who need clothing, every time we care for the sick, every time that we show kindness in the name of Jesus, it's an opportunity for someone to receive that unexpected moment, but it's also an opportunity for Jesus to receive an expression of our love. As Jesus says, as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So when we care for people in unexpected ways, does Jesus not receive that as fully as Jesus receives this kindness from this woman? 
How would things be different if every time we did something for someone else, we had this image of Jesus receiving in our minds? How would things be different if every time we did something for someone, we had the thought in our mind of, I love you, Lord? Every time we show kindness to someone, we do this for Jesus. This was the unexpected moment for Jesus. And every time we show the extravagant love of God to someone else, we create an unexpected moment for them, but we also create an opportunity for Jesus to receive. And so as followers of Jesus, let's live like this and not this. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let the church say, amen. Amen and amen. I want to let you know about a book study that's coming up. It is um, going to begin the last Wednesday of March, and I will lead that. We'll do it uh, in Zoom format. But it is uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. It's by Ibram X. Kendi. And uh, if you'd like to be part of that book study, I would encourage you to. And all you have to do is uh, let us know in the office, and we'll make sure that you get uh, in the email notifications and get you uh, to be able to participate in that. So, uh, so that's coming up. I'm going to invite us now to worship God with the giving of these gifts. There'll be instructions on your screen of how to give through text messaging, how to give online, and also, of course, there's also the U.S. mail. Let's worship God together.
for bringing us these gifts that we might bring them back to you, knowing that they will go from home to home and place to place to share your peace and your comfort and to know that we are here to help them as well. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Let us close our service with When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Join our voices together. I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss. I look forward to seeing you all in person next week, although we will also be online at the same time, but I uh, look forward to seeing you in person. Registration is going to open up today, Sunday at noon. I hope that you'll register, and, um, and I look forward to seeing you on Palm Sunday. And now may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, bless you, remain with you, and protect you always. Amen. <laughs>